So, okay, so it's time to start. Hello and welcome. I suppose this is the last presentation slot in the main summit side. I'm pleased to see that you still had energy and interest to come and see our presentation, which is OpenStack with real-time applications. My name is Juha Ravainen, and I'm working in Nokia in mobile networks architecture and technology unit. Okay, my name is Tapio Talangri, and I work in, in Juha's team in the mobile networks, and I'm also the chairman of the technical steering committee in the OPNFE project. So I have a few advertisements for OPNFE also in my part of the presentation. Good. So, today's agenda. First, we have a short intro. Then we talk from radio cloud requirements. And last part of our presentation is from real-time optimization, which we have divided into three parts. WIM, NFVI, and VNF. So, what these abbreviations mean? WIM is more or less uh, OpenStack. NFVI is the actual hardware and the virtualization layer, and VNFs are the real applications. So, what we are doing in architecture and technology? In our portfolio, there are all kind of fancy things. Uh, together with Tapia, we are working with among other th things, open source, like OPNFV, OpenStack, and some other projects, cloud in core and radio networks, data centers, and so on and so on. At the beginning of our presentation, we would like to show you a short two minutes video, which gives an overview from our presentation. See what you're wondering about. Touch it. Feel it. But sometimes the most wondrous things are the ones you can't see. But they're there. These are the things that work so well that you don't even need to think about them. They're not designed to be noticed. They don't have to be seen. They're just made to work, or even to work wonders. Like technology that enables a network that acts intuitively. A scalable network designed to grow with people, offering unlimited capacity with less effort than ever before. Designed not just to meet their needs, but to anticipate them. A network that is made to adapt to people, communities, and the future. Whatever big and wondrous things it may bring. And now, the biggest thing you'll ever see is the biggest thing you'll never see. Meeting the network needs of today, tomorrow, and the future. Nokia Airscale Radio Access. The mobile industry, as we know, is going through a radical transformation. Just think about smart cities, Internet of Things, connected cars, e-health. The list just goes on and on. As the future becomes even more unpredictable, the key requirements for mobile networks are agility and adaptability. Adaptability is most effective if it takes place automatically in the background. From network elements to mobile phone applications, we often take technology for granted without realizing what really happens behind the scenes. 
Sometimes the most powerful things are not designed to be noticed, like you saw from the previous video. Current activities are concentrating to clarify core network functions, but the next move is to support real-time applications. And to get real-time applications clarified, support is needed from hardware, from cloud stack, and from, from the applications. And we will cover all these parts in this presentation. Telco and IT worlds are merging. Scalability, flexibility, agility are IT cloud characteristics. But at the same time, we need also to support telco key requirements. Cloud needs to be proactive. It needs to be telco VNF aware. Cloud needs to be fast. And it needs to be traffic and cost optimized. Next part is from radio cloud requirements. Five G is the new generation of radio systems and network architecture delivering extreme broadband and ultra robust low latency connectivity and massive networking for the Internet of Things to enable the programmable world which will transform our individual lives economy and society. The industry has adopted view that 5G will, will be about people and things as per the following three use cases. Massive broadband that delivers gigabytes of bandwidth on demand. Critical machine type communication that allows for the immediate synchronous eye hand feedback that enables remote control over robots and massive machine type communication that connects billions of sensors and machines. And flexibility and reliability are the key design principles in 5G. And here are some, some numbers which visualize how short latencies we are talking about. On the left hand side, uh, the green bars indicate some human reflection times to get better understanding from these latencies. So 120 milliseconds is the time what it takes when sprinters like Usain Bolt starts running. And if it's less than 100 milliseconds, then it's a four start. This is comparable to latency. What is acceptable, for example, in cloud gaming. Seven milliseconds is the time when you blink your eye which is pretty fast, but even that's not enough uh, to 4G virtualized run or, or 5G. And the latencies are coming from, from networking and processing times. So on the right hand side, you can see that how long it takes in optical fiber when, when the data goes 100 kilometers, so the round trip time is about one millisecond, and the round trip time is from A to B and back, back to A. So, like already said, 5G brings latency requirements to a new level. Uh, in 3G, end to end latency is about 20 milliseconds, in 4G, it's about 10 milliseconds, and in 5G, we are talking about one millisecond or even less. So this means new radio and also new architecture is required to full low 5G latency requirements. And one other aspect is amount of mobile data. Here you can see mobile data usage growth in the past years. And the growth has been pretty massive. For example, in Finland, where we are coming from, Last year it was about five gigabytes per subscriber per month. Hey, you, I think you have old information here. I just saw that uh, mobile subscribers of a Finnish uh, mobile operator they were using 13 gigabytes per, per month in August. So that's pretty big yeah. number of cat videos people have been watching with their mobile phones. Yeah. 
So this is until 2015 and this 13 gigabytes, it's, it's about two or three times more than, than last year, so the massive growth is, is just continuing. All right, so then I hand over to Tapio, who will talk about real-time optimization. Okay, so now when you think about this uh, OpenStack, you may think that, okay, OpenStack is not in the data path. It doesn't have much to do with, uh, uh, with sort of the, the real-time, meeting the real-time requirements. But however, what, where OpenStack has a, has a role, it's in sort of deciding where the VMs are running and sort of enabling some of this optimizations in the data path. So here's a, a diagram that I'm going to refer to. This is the Etsy uh, VNF working group, sort of F Etsy reference diagram. Uh, the virtualized infrastructure manager, which of course in our case is the OpenStack, that's on the right-hand side, it's part of the management. And what we have on the left-hand side is this NFVI, the network function virtualization infrastructure, which consists of the hypervisor, the virtual switching and the hardware. And we're talk, going to talk about all of those because all of those have an impact on the VNF. And then finally, we come to this VNF and how the VNF can, can uh, be optimized to improve the performance. So I'll start with um, the, so talk about the, the VNF and how, sorry, the, the OpenStack and how the OpenStack is enabling the real-time optimization. So I have a picture here of the Open Compute platform, which is a, a great open source uh, hardware platform, and I'm actually going to talk more about that. So instead of blades or servers, it has this thing called sleds that you can slide in and slide out. And on the right-hand side, there's a picture from above, which is sort of gives you an idea what, what the whole thing looks like. There's two CPU sockets, and then there's memories attached to the CPU sockets, and you have the, uh, a PCI slot in the bottom, and then in the other picture you see that there's a, you have a riser, and then you plug in the NIC cards to the, to the riser. And here's the, actually it's a schematic about the same thing. You see there's this sort of a CPU sockets, memories attached to it, there's a QPI connection between the sockets, and then the one of, exactly one of the sockets is connected to the PCI uh, bus and that way also to the network interface card. So when the packets come in, they go to the one socket. And that's actually important. And, but the first thing we look at is this um, place, placing, sort of being aware of this, of this topology. So there's two sockets. Uh, it makes a difference whether your application is running all in one socket, all in another socket, or if you have a, a sort of a big application which doesn't, which cannot run on one socket only, then you want to have an idea like how it's, uh, how it's going to be placed on this hardware. So in OpenStack these days you have this uh, capability to define the flavor. You can, in the, define, in the flavor you can define how many NUMA nodes, in other words how many CPU sockets you want the application to see you can tell how many CPUs you have on each of those sockets, and then you can also allocate how much memory you have on each of those sockets. So that's one optimization that can be quite useful and actually is used in the solution that we talk about. Another thing is this uh, uh, CPU policy and the CPU thread policy. So this, the, the VNF that we're talking about, that's not the only thing running uh, on the same CPU, so we can define whether we want to sort of dedicate the CPU cores to our application or whether it's okay that we have other applications sharing the same CPU. And the same thing goes, so that's about the CPU policy. It can be dedicated or not. And then same, similar thing with the CPU threads. So inside of the, the CPU, we have the, the cores. Inside of the core, you have two hyper threads. The two hyper threads are actually sharing uh, same resources in the Intel architecture. And then with the CPU thread policy, you can define whether you want to have just a single, uh, okay, if you want to have your hyperthread to be the only hyperthread which is running on that core. And that, that's one way of sort of guaranteeing latencies because then you know that it's, it's the, it has this sort of dedicated resource for itself. And then finally, uh, the, 
fin final piece in this, in this placement thing is this PCI pass-through, which is an optimization. You may have heard about this SRV uh, term. It's the SRV and, and PCI pass-through are roughly the same thing. And when you're using PCI pass-through or SRV, then you're making a PCI device directly accessible to a virtual machine. And as I said, when a packet comes in, it goes over the PCI uh, bus to exactly one socket. And then if your VM is running into a different socket, then it's obvious that it's not going to be as fast as if the VM is running in the, the right socket where the packet first arrives. So what OpenStack does is actually, if you have a PCI pass-through, OpenStack will figure out uh, which socket your VM should be running. So you don't have to actually worry about that. You just have to define uh, the CPU, uh, the, the PCI pass-through. Then a little bit related thing, which is not so much about real time, it's about uh, the fault management, about the, I mean, it's, it's a sort of a, something that we have been working on and which is very close to, to what we do is, is um, this thing where we want to monitor the host, the server, and in the beginning of time, a few years ago, it, it was so that there was sort of no monitoring, no active notification to the Nova DB. If a, a server didn't respond, then the Nova just marked in the database that, okay, this doesn't seem to be responding. I'm not going to place any VMs on this server. And that was it. But that was, that's maybe not ideal, and, and we got actually good feedback from the operator community about that. What we have now built in the OPNFE and, and also done in, in OpenStack is this, there's this uh, mechanism where you can have a, sort of a, an inspector on the server which will monitor all the time the health of the server. You will notice immediately or really fast if the server is not, it has failed. There's the Vitrage OpenStack component uh, which can which gets this, not, which will notice it through the inspector, and then the vitrage can uh, mark that this host is not responding. And, and there is a new API implemented to sort of uh, to, to, to tell Nova that now to stop using this; it's down, it's not working. And then with vitrage, you can also have a notification going to the VNF manager. So if you have a sort of a, some VM in your application, which is managing the rest of the VM, the, uh, that's the VNF manager. The VNF manager can sort of do some recovery actions, for example, before, uh, it's like sometimes you, have, you can do things like failovers and, and things like that. And our goal is to make that really fast. It's, we're talking about like less than, well, less than one second uh, uh, that from the time that the host is, is failing to the time that you get these notifications going around. Then, of course, it might take a little bit longer to do some recovery actions if you have to boot a VM or, or do some application-level stuff. It's okay. okay, so that was the sort of OpenStack part. Next, I'll talk about a little bit about server hardware. It's very interesting about the hypervisor improvements and then talk about a little bit going to the future with the virtual switch offload and, and things that we see coming. So now, in this Etsy diagram, we are talking about the left-hand side, Linux, Open vSwitch, DPDK, and also hardware. I'm going to talk, start with the hardware. So one direction where we are going is, is definitely, it's always faster networking. Now we're going on this path of like 25 gigs, 50 gigs, 100 gigs. Um, we have, in our system that we have, we have hardware acceleration for crypto. IPsec uh, offloading. We also have hardware acceleration for packet switching, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit more. And then there's all kind of little things which allows me to say that it's telco optimized hardware. This has to do with the BIOS settings and, and how the BIOS is optimized and how it's verified and tested, and also about like how many NICs you have and what kind of network connectivity you have and, and things like that. Um, I mentioned this open compute project already earlier. Uh, it's very exciting. You probably heard about, I mean, it, it's, a, it's a project that was started by Facebook and then they wanted other companies to join it. And the idea is to make the, the hardware 
open and, and so that you would have like an ecosystem around that area. And Nokia is also participating and contributing to the Open Compute project. We have uh, specs like, for example, 48 volts specification and earthquake proofness of, of the hardware infrastructure, things like that, which are typically important for telcos. Many telcos have uh, central offices which have 48 volt. Uh, the, so the open, benefits of the Open Compute project that you have more servers per square foot or, or square meter. It improve, improves the, the energy efficiency. And it also has, it's easier maintenance. So with this rack servers, you have to sort of, you know, unscrew it, slide it out. It's very heavy. You have to put it on the floor, open the screws, replace the components, and, and then lift it back. It takes minutes to do it like that. With the open computer, just unconnect the plugs, out it goes. So all of this is, is giving you the lower cost of ownership. Now, of course, after telling so much about this open compute project, I'm sure you want to see it in practice. So I went to our lab, and we actually have the latest Nokia branded OCP hardware, and I took a picture. I hope the, the picture worked OK. Oh, damn, there's some, OK, sorry, you can see the hardware here. There's some idiot standing in front of the camera, but anyway, this, you see the sleds here and the, the blue colors and the, and the connections and so forth. OK, um, these are some, OK, so that, that was about the hardware. Then I'm going to talk about um, sort of the, the hypervisor improvements. And now I took some slides from I, OK, this is some slides from actually OPNFE Summit, where I gave a, a similar a presentation about the, an OPNFE project, which is looking at improving the real-time performance of, of KVM. And what I show here is this um, kind of round-trip latencies, I mean, the, the, I mean, which is sort of a, a nice way of measuring the, the performance of the hypervisor. So you have a traffic generator, you're sending packets in through one interface, you have a DPDK-based um, forwarder, and then that's sort of a forwarding and sending the packets back on the other side, and then you take the measurements. And you can see that the average latency has improved from uh, 290 microseconds to, to, to 20 microseconds, which is pretty impressive. And also the, the maximum latency has also gone down to about like 100 microseconds. These are measurements that I think we actually did in our labs. And then there, here's another picture where it's just to give you an idea that there's a, a, a big difference uh, in sort of, re I mean, there, there is a difference between like real-time optimized uh, KVM and general KVM. And especially the difference is with the small packets small packet sizes and, and the latency for the small packet sizes. That's the most critical thing for us. Then I promise to say something about the future, some of the things that are happening. So um, one thing that we have is this uh, software. So currently, so uh, OK. There's this OVS, and then there's the currently what we have is quite commonly is the software-based software switch, uh, sorry, V switch with DPDK acceleration. And here's some kind of a, a rough schematic of what it looks like. The packet comes in through the NIC, and then it goes to a, a queue. Then there's this V switch, uh, which is actually has the DPDK pole mode driver. It takes that, then there is the software virtual switch, which is doing the switching, and then there is virtual port driver, which is the sort of implementing the, uh, the, the virtual NIC interface towards the, the virtual machine. And then, of course, on the right-hand side, you have the OpenStack Neutron plugin, which is controlling the, the virtual switch. With the, one thing that we're having is this iNIC, intelligent NIC, uh, where you actually take some of the functionality away from the software switch, which is running in, in the Linux kernel, and you're actually doing that in the network interface card. So you have this model where, I mean, you, anyway, in this network interface card, you have this embedded switch. You have been able to do, I mean, things like uh, putting 
packets with different VLAN tags to different queues, things like that. So this is sort of extending that idea that I would be able to sort of do some of this flow processing uh, in, the, in the virtual switch inside of the hardware, which will of course make a big difference. And as I said, that you're moving beyond 10 gigabits, you're moving to 25, 50, 100 gigabits, something like that. So this kind of technology has become very interesting. Uh, then the logical conclusion of, of that is going to be that you have this whole uh, virtual switch inside of the NIC card and that's also quite exciting idea that you actually have an open flow interface uh, to the NIC and then you can think about NIC like, a, okay, you manage the NIC like a, okay, like a V switch, it has a, with, with open flow command and then there's some kind of local user engine which is for one of the command, and you still have the, the OpenStack Neutron uh, plugin controlling the whole thing. Uh, finally, I have this uh, crypto offload uh, as a sort of the hardware features, and this is something that you can actually get already, but it's a, it's a little bit related to this. So here you have the packet comes in from the, to the NIC, uh, then it, oh, it should say E-switch, uh, it goes to the, to the VM, and then the VM can use a crypto access, uh, sort of cryptic accelerator, some kind of hardware which is able to do certain kind of com uh, computations very quickly and uh, sort of offload those calculations to the hardware device. And that's sort of visible as, as a PCI device to the, to the virtual machine. And now from this picture, as you can guess, if you have big packets, there's a big benefit in offloading the calculation because it can take a long time if you have to, to sort of do the crypto algorithms. If you have small packet, the benefit is not that good uh, because you can, okay, because you have an extra step here. You have to go to the, over the PCI bus to the device and then come back and that's at some latency. So there's a trade-off. You have to be, be careful about this. Um, one thing I just wanted to mention is that uh, there's OPNFE has a lot of interesting stuff going on. One of them is, is the Yardstick project and I just wanted to sort of show a picture of uh, some of the sort of testing that you can sort of very easily do in the Yardstick. The idea is that you, I mean, you're like the, all kind of tests built in. You can just start it and then there's this Grafana interface that allows you to, to view it. What I have here is I was running this Etsy test case 002, which is actually just the same, sending a ping message with different packet sizes between two virtual machines. And this, the scale on the left hand side is, I think is milliseconds. So this is not a, a great result, but this is some kind, um, this, this example is not that great in that sense, but I mean, it's showing that, okay, it's, it's working, it's, it's less than, less than a millisecond latency in here. But there's a lot of different test cases built into Yardstick and and that's, um, that can be easily taken into use if you want to run your own tests uh, and have a nice graphical user interface to it. Okay, thanks. Okay, thanks Tapsa. So, Tapia already covered this uh, Vim and NFVI layers and uh, now I'm going to talk about those VNFs which are the real applications. So this is what we have and continue to have. Here you can see some 2G, 3G, 4G and some other existing techniques. And current mobile networks are like this. It might look like a mess, and maybe it is a mess, but anyway it's working. So this is the current situation. And this is where we are going. On the left hand side, you can see the physical antenna sites. And there is uh, antenna, radio frequencies, radios, low layers. In between, we have transport. And then on the right hand side, we have cloud. And in the cloud, in this case, there are these higher radio layers, mobile edge computing, distributed core, and, and, and so on. And this looks pretty much 
simpler. And how this uh, non-real-time, real-time partition goes in Cloudified Run. So the non-real-time non part uh, are in the cloud, and the real-time parts, meaning the lower layers, are in the physical sets. There are a lot of cryptical abbreviations in this picture, but let's not go into that, those details. But anyway, so the, the main idea here is that the split is, has been done between real-time and non-real-time layers. And here is one example from Helsinki City Center, where we are coming from. And Helsinki is definitely not one of the biggest cities in the world. But even, even from this picture, you can see that in, in one square kilometer, there can be tens of base stations. And this kind of network can carry about 0 0.5 gigabytes traffic per square kilometer. So this example is from 3G, but in 4G density is not really much higher, and there we are talking about different kind of numbers. But this might give you some ideas of that why, why radio is also beneficial to put, put into the cloud. And the steps which we have taken and will be taken in evolution towards cloud. So the physical parts, uh, like remote radio heads, part of base stations and access points, are in the physical sites, in the left-hand side. Then we have distributed clusters and centralized clusters. And there I have also some, some examples from these VNFs, which have been cloudified. So E-Node-B is, is base station. Then we have base station controllers, radio network controllers, Wi-Fi controllers, mobile edge computing, evolved packet core network elements, and, and so on. And because our presentation was mainly focused to radio side, in my last side, you can see the radio VNFs, which we have already cloudified in Nokia, so, so base station, radio network controller, and Wi-Fi controllers. So they are already available. So, thank you. Any questions? Total silence. <laughs> Yeah, that's so. Question is, do we have a hardware portfolio for the cloud? Yes. Yeah, it's possible to order it. Yes. Yeah. Okay, there was a question about how, the, how does this crypto acceleration work, and actually I'm happy to tell, <laughs> be very detailed about this, because I just did it in the summer. I was doing testing IPsec performance. I set up an IPsec tunnel between two virtual machines and two physical computers. And it, it, in the end, when I got it to work, it was very easy, because I just took the latest Fedora. It has all the drivers built in. I sort of, okay, the, the cloud was, of course, built so that I have this, S, I mean, it was using SRV PCI pass-through, so from the cloud point of view, I could see that there was this um, hardware device. I assigned the hardware device to the virtual machine, the Fedora virtual machine, when I booted it. It recognized the PCI device. It loaded the right drivers. And then when I started this uh, Strong Swan, I, I was using Strong Swan to set up the connection. It just loaded the strong one and it, the strong one and the Linux kernel and everything. It was able to just use it. And it was offloading everything. And I was able to look at the counters on the hardware side in the, you know, the, you know, that to sort of verify that it really was using it. And the performance for big packets was, was really, really, really good. So you could see that it was doing something. At the, so that's basically, I mean, it's, 
No, yeah, um, short answer to your question, does it work the same way as with physical one? Yes, it does. It's just that with SRLV and it's a virtual function instead of a physical device that it works. Yes? <laughs> I think you guys have <laughs> been heading this, uh, the demo work and the... Uh, lessons learned from remain from Radio Cloud or yeah. Yeah, more impact on the Alpinas. Lessons learned. Okay, it was not easy. <laughs> <laughs> what a and, and and you need to think about that that how do you do it? Like like I mentioned in one of those slides to show this real time and non real time time. The, the split there. So you need to take a, into account a lot of things because these delays are coming, for example, from the fiber and, and it, it, it uh, depends what kind of backbone you have. So the one solution doesn't fit, fit to everybody. And you need, you need to do a lot of work on the application side because you sort of, you have a monolithic application in the beginning and then you're sort of slicing it up into both sides. But I think from OpenStack point of view it was not that painful that, you know, it was more like the, really the application. Yeah, maybe the tuning and optimizing. Problems things. were in, in, in the other components. Yeah. Ik. Well, I'm surprised to see that there is no mention of any like real-time kernel or any of that stuff. Is it not needed anymore? There was a real-time kernel. Okay. Yeah, it was part of the real-time KVM. It comes with that. These numbers I showed from the real-time KVM project, it was also using a real-time kernel. And then it was using real-time KVM. Yeah. So yes, it's, it's part of the big. Uh, the the real-time KVM. You just, the, it's the OPNFE. Uh, there's a, if you go to OPNFE website, it's the, KVM for NFV project has built this um, uh, the sort of a, okay they have they have built a, there's there's a kernel and everything that they have done and it's part of this OP NFV distribution and I don't remember which installer it had. Launch up and then they will install the rest of the system, and that's where you, how you get the, the real time uh, kernel and the real time KVM. And, and if you want to test it, it should work quite Okay, thanks. I lost my voice. And you showed some nice data on uh, packages. Do you have any I think we mainly what we done. I mean, we're mainly looking at packet, packet latencies um, because that's like the interesting thing. I think it's more like the interrupt latencies is, is sort of an enabler for the <laughs> packet latencies. So we did also are measuring interrupt latencies and also on things at the lower level. But that's more like making sure that that you know you, you want to figure out what, where the latencies come from, whether it's the networking layer and so forth. So uh, for example, I mentioned this optimized hardware. So first thing they always tell you when you do real-time applications is to take real-time hardware. So I, I was doing that kind of testing also to sort of to, to do the measure the interrupt latencies to verify that I'm not getting any extra latencies from the hardware because with some hardware you do get long latencies, like millisecond latencies. And then it's good to know where they come from. Thank you. As I mentioned in that, so you're trying to optimize the mixing paths. So my question is that, so why is the bottleneck? I mean that, so if we can find bottleneck, we can maybe do more resource or anything for that. Reason. If I can do that, that will help. Can you move the whole 
I'm sorry, I, <laughs> I didn't understand the code. No, I didn't get it. Yes. So this long, and so that means that the, the package will go control through the NIC, yes. PM, or OS, or DK, or which machine. Yes. So they will cross so many components. So yes. I mean that my question is that which one is bottleneck? So it may be. Yeah, okay, quick cool question is that you have a bucket that's going long way, what, which one is the slow one <laughs> that uh, uh, can really tell immediately because but always when you do this testing you sort of you only can test like end to end okay. you cannot tell whether the thing is that yeah sorry I can't <laughs> really <laughs> I mean that's, it's obvious I mean with things like SRV reason to use SRV is that you can bypass some things like the V switch for example you can go directly to that and that would be one way of sort of comparing the V switch overheads and Okay, thanks. I think that we have used our time and mm -hmm. thank you. Yeah.